Um, good night, pleasant good evening and welcome back to another episode of HealthWise by the St. Kitts and Nevis Medical and Dental Association in collaboration with ZIZ Television. To all you out there in TV and internet land, good night. I have here with me a full panel and I'm hoping that everyone can definitely benefit from the very lively discussion tonight. I have here um, as my guest, I have Mr. Anthony Mills. Um, Mr. Glenville Liburd um, and Mrs. Marcia Brown. Um, Anthony Mills will be was is currently the public relations officer of the St. Kitts Nevis Association of Persons with Disabilities, and Mr. Liburd is a founder of Nevis CBR Advocates. Mrs. M Marcia Brown is the coordinator for Disability Services, Ministry of Youth Empowerment, Aging and Disabilities. So this show is going to honor the International Day of Persons with Disabilities, jointly organized by the St. Kitts Nevis Association of Persons with Disabilities and Lake Health and Wellbeing. The central theme aims to explore strategies for eliminating stigma associated with disabilities while advocating for systemic changes to create a more inclusive society. So we'll be back after a short break to elaborate on these points. Thank you. It's that time of year and Office Machines is giving that free to all customers who will be purchasing any Xerox photocopier, printer and scan machine solutions during the months of November and December. This offer is supported by the most experienced, trained and competent field service repair and maintenance staff in St. Kitts and Nevis. Come see us at our offices on Keon Street, Pastor St. Kitts, telephone number 465-4046 or at the Solomon's Arcade in Charlestown, Nevis, telephone number 469-5883. This is no gimmick. Come or give us a call. We are ready to make you happy that you have invested in the best with a Xerox machine supported by caring and professional service. Terms and conditions apply. It's that time of year and Office Machines is giving that free to all customers who will be purchasing any Xerox photocopier, printer and scan machine solutions during the months of November and December. This offer is supported by the most experienced, trained and competent field service repair and maintenance staff in St. Kitts and Nevis. Come see us at our offices on Keon Street, Pastor St. Kitts, telephone number 465-4046 or at the Solomon's Arcade in Charlestown, Nevis, telephone number 469-5883. This is no gimmick. Come or give us a call. We are ready to make you happy that you have invested in the best with a Xerox machine supported by caring and professional service. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back again and again we are discussing the removing the stigma, advocating for change while building a more inclusive society and so I will take it to my guests who will give a brief introduction of themselves and what they do for our community. I guess I can start with um, Mr. Mills, Mr. Anthony Mills. Yeah, good evening, um, the, the listening audience. And my name is Anthony Mills. I'm the PRO for the St. Kitts Nevis Association of Persons with Disabilities. And we thought that this would be a good way 
to begin a national conversation on disability and trying to remove stigma that is attached to disabilities. So that's one of the reasons that we are having this panel discussion tonight. Okay, thank you. And I have here with me um, Mr. Dr. Glenville Leibert. Could you introduce yourself Certainly, to us? Certainly, and good evening. Was lovely host and my colleague Anthony and Mauricia. I am Dr. Glenville Leibert of Nevis. I'm a medical doctor, anesthesiologist by specialty, but I got involved with community activism. My work with thinking of Social Security Board got me to see that persons with disabilities are not properly provided for. So around 2010, I began to research how can help these persons, and that led me to discover community-based rehabilitation, and I've, I've been passionately advocating for it ever since then. Awesome. So do you advocate in St. Kitts and Nevis or just Nevis? Across the Caribbean as well and oh worldwide. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's nice. And then we are going to have Miss Maricia Brown. She'll give us an introduction of um, herself and what she does. Good night, everyone. My name is Mrs. Maricia Brown. I'm the coordinator for disability services. Um, I was previously transferred from social development and gender affairs when the ministry began on um, youth empowerment, aging and disabilities when it began in or launched in February. I was transferred there and basically my role is to help bring awareness to the population which is often marginalized and to see how best we can put programs or policies in place to help them so and help them to be able to do so while achieving the government's overall goal. Okay, okay, that's awesome. So um, we'll move the show right along. Um, you're gonna have introductory remarks? Uh, I guess so. Uh, the St. Nevis Association of Persons with Disabilities for Persons Who Don't Know was founded in 1981 and we have a mandate to improve the lives of persons with disabilities. We do this through advocacy, education, peer support. We provide services for people with disabilities where we can and try to connect persons with disabilities with the available resources that are there. So, and every year around this time, we celebrate International Day of Persons with Disabilities with a week of activities. And this year we thought that the panel discussion would be a good way to go because, uh, like I said earlier, we can begin that national conversation where we can get people to engage and realize that um, there has to be something done to, to ensure that persons with disabilities are treated equally in the community. Mm -hmm. And so in order to do this, we need the voice of everybody, mm -hmm. you know, working together to and I think Dr. Leibold would talk about it more because CBR is a framework that can get everybody together to work towards achieving this goal here. Awesome. Um, I have one quick question. Perhaps you can, we can open the discussion. Um, how can a grassroots advocacy initi initiate, initiative effectively contribute to changing societal attitudes towards disability? How do you think? Well, um, grassroots is a um, more of a bottom-up approach. Yes. And in trying to bring about this change, you need more of a bottom-up approach than, and you, you need to be able to give people with disabilities a voice in the decision-making because too many times the decisions are made for us, mm -hmm. without us, and then even with the best of intentions, they don't work properly. So if you have people at the grassroots level, people, um, the everyday person, the family members, the community members working together it, with the government agencies and with other civil society organizations, it would help to bring about these changes much more quicker. And more smooth. Yeah, and it would give persons with disabilities a greater voice. Okay, awesome. So in your experience, what are the key obstacles preventing the full integration of persons with disabilities into the facets of society? And how can these be addressed, you think? Well, one of the main things hindering persons is attitude. 
because um, people tend to think that people with disabilities um, is not capable of doing a whole lot of stuff and so we get marginalized and then stuff change and so one of the things that we have to get done is that we have to get government to look at the laws and begin to change the legislation because a lot of it starts there mm -hmm. okay L let's look at like say the building codes if we don't get government to change the building codes people like myself get shut out of more and more of the country because building keeps going up there's no access so that um, people with disabilities can do business in there unless they get somebody to do the business for them and then it's not every time that you want somebody in your business you know so you want to be able to have that sense of independence mm -hmm. and that happens when we can get the government to change the laws we can get civil society to realize that even without the laws being changed that businesses can make the necessary pro provisions mm -hmm. to ensure that people with disabilities we need to ensure that information itself is also accessible to people with all type of disabilities so this is how we can begin to to bring about the change it's it's not something that we expect to happen overnight mm -hmm. but it's some that's why we're here today is to begin that conversation awesome i understand so in terms of law making and policy making you think in your opinion you have adequate representation in terms of persons who can help to bring about those changes that you speak of because this would mean you would need representation in the higher levels so do you think you have adequate representation for such well i would say that um, th this government is off to a good start I would say right um, the ministry that Ms. Brown represents is there to ensure that we can have that conversation mm -hmm. but I think that um, people with disabilities need to be given a greater voice of course. and the organizations that represent people with disabilities need to be included more in the decision making I think that's where it, it has to of course, start. The way the policies yeah. are yeah. being made, of course. Yeah, because if you continue to do it without us being involved, a lot of the times it's not going to be done in a way that affects us in the most positive way. Because you like you were doing it from a, a perspective of a person who don't have a disability. So they really don't know, understand that the people with the disabilities are the professionals when it comes to making these changes and so there need to be more consultation and that's I think that's where it has to start. It has to start with more consultation between people with disabilities, the organizations that represent people with disabilities, the government and the private sector all has to begin to work together and give people with disability that greater voice. Awesome, I agree. So, what policies and interventions would you like to see introduced by the government to integrate persons with disabilities into society and, you know, to combat stigma? Well, we, the government signed and ratified the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So now we have to start to implement it, right? We have to look at our building codes have an appendix in it called Appendix F. And Appendix FT speaks to accessibility issues. So what we need the government to do is take Appendix F and make the provisions in it mandatory. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't make the provisions in it mandatory, then now we're trying to wait until you can revise the whole building codes and that leaves people with disabilities further behind. So the first thing we have to get them to do is to make Appendix F mandatory, then look at the, r the other laws, the labor laws, look at the justice system and ensure that it works for people with disabilities because right now a lot of it don't work for people with disabilities could you give us an example like in terms of the government legislature how how, how do you find that our laws are putting persons with disabilities at a disadvantage you would do you have an example of such well there's no law that say that people can specifically discriminate against persons with disabilities and in a lot of cases we end up being the last to be hired and the first to be fired because you are per like okay let's look at this I call a business the other day to talk about access and the first thing the guy on the phone asked me if there was a law that said that he has to do it 
right? And then he turned, he turned again and he gave me an email address and tell me to send him the law. And if I send him the law, then okay. he will talk to the engineers. But there is no such law. So I can't send him the law. So that means he's not going to talk to the engineers and then persons with disabilities get shut out. You know? And that happens a lot around in the country and perhaps maybe we can tackle it and let business places know it can only benefit them if they you know try to make certain things more accessible because if it's a business the aim is to attract as many customers as possible so I mean if you're a customer with spending money I should probably make it easier for you to access my facilities it would probably be but better for me that's kind of what we try to tell the businesses mm -hmm. because okay most persons with disabilities have a phone. Mm -hmm. This is connected to flow network, but I can't go into flow. So if I go to flow, I'm stuck on the sidewalk waiting for somebody to come out. Mm -hmm. But every month I top up my phone, put the plan on there, and that happens not just with me, but with a lot of other people with disabilities. And they can, even when some of them go in there, there's no way for a person to go, who is deaf to go into flow and have a meaningful experience because nobody in there knows sign language. Mm -hmm. So these are the little things that could help. And then some businesses are totally not accessible. So when somebody like me go into town, I have to sit on the sidewalk and ask somebody to come out. And sometimes you could look at the person's face coming out and know that they really don't want to come out here in the sun. You know, because they're coming out of the air condition and they really don't want to come out here in the sun, but they have to. So if we can make those, some of the changes can be done now. And that's what we're trying to get government to understand that the ones that you can do now, do it now, then look at what we can do in the midterm and the long term. Let's kind of break it down mm -hmm. because um, the longer you wait, the worse it gets for people with disabilities the more further we get left behind. And I like to say to government when I speak to them that it's going to take something like an affirmative action to get people with disabilities to catch up. Yes, because that businessman really didn't show any compassion to you at all. So it's not like people are open to having empathy because he's saying um, unless it's enforced, then he's really not interested. So unless he has the backative or law enforcement breathing down his neck to just have some compassion he's not willing or able to just and that's why we got to take it we just signed and ratified the UN convention when was this so, um, in 2019 2019 yeah. okay so we need to begin to implement that convention we, we need to get government to write the necessary legislation that can make the convention be enforceable so we'll, we'll stick a thumbnail on that because then maybe we can kind of highlight some of the main things of this convention because this is the first that I'm hearing of it. I'm sure persons out there would be curious to know what this convention is all about as well. So yeah, so um, we'll move along. I thank you. We'll stick a thumbnail on that and we'll come back to it later on in the discussion. Right? Okay. Um, so we'll take a quick break. And uh, we'll be back with um, more discussion with the other panels, panelists. Make this season merry with Quartz Ready Cash. Get all you need with a cash loan of up to $20,000 and pay nothing for 90 days. That's why you pay nothing until 2024. Plus, you can enter to win up to $20,000 in the Ready Cash Mega Money Roadshow. All you need is your ID, proof of address, payslip, job letter, and two references. Apply online at shopquartz.com or visit your nearest Quartz or Ready Cash store. And Make the season merry with Quartz Ready Cash. We are ready when you are. Conditions apply. National Home Loans. Get your dream home. I'm an accountant. And you know what excites me? Precision. Just like crunching numbers accurately, National Bank's Apex Mortgage offers the lowest interest rate in the country. 3.99% guaranteed. 
Precision is essential in construction as well. Just buy Apex Mortgage's attention to the detail of our dreams. If you are a college or university graduate, this is your opportunity. Details are everything for an engineer and Apex Mortgage recognizes this. Offering up to 40 years for repayment, it perfectly complements my home ownership needs. Plus, National has my back with a three month payment grace period. Apex Mortgage for me and me. And me too. National Home Loans. Home ownership made easy. When you're with National, you're home. Thank you. And once again, welcome back to another episode of HealthWise. And I have next to me uh, Mr. Dr. Glenville Liburd of the Nevis Sevier Advocates. And so I will um, hand the mic over to Dr. Glenville. Good night again. Good evening again. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about the concept of community-based rehabilitation and um, how can support how can it support children and adults with disabilities and ensure their full participation and inclusion? We were just speaking about that. A very good question. <laughs> and when I was young in the medical profession. You're still young, yes, <laughs> still young. In 1970, the WHO at the in Al Ma'ata in the Western Republic of Kazakhstan declared hell for all by the year 2000. And in that big global agenda, CBI began to be promoted as a strategy in oh, community so it, development. It, it was founded somewhere else. It wasn't founded here, that initiative. Well, CBI is a WHO, oh. it's a WHO programmatic, programmatic in agenda. Initiative. initiative. I yeah. thought it was yours. No, 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 no. That's a WHO which I'm just promoting okay. in country and okay. in the region. So, awesome. Health for All in 1978, CBI was part of that strategic framework. It began as a health primarily health sector initiative, but over the years, they realized that people have more than health needs. Mm -hmm. They have need for education, social support, mm -hmm. livelihood support, mm -hmm. empowerment support. And so in the current era, CBI has more from a primary health sector to a multi-sectoral initiative. And around 2010, they revised the, they revised the CBI guidelines to make it what they call a multi-sectoral with what they call a CBI matrix, showing the linkages between health, education, social services, empowerment, livelihood sectors. Mm -hmm. And then there's a cross links, there's the up and down the ladder kind of thing. So y you could use that matrix and start anywhere and begin to work backward or forward to plan a program based on your particular interests and so the client behind it's you. It's a non-profit in initiative? It's a non-profit? Well, one of the objects of CBI is to create and promote a strength on community groups. Okay. So yes, there's a large non-profit sector as well, but any sector, any organization could adopt CBR because it is a strategy and it could also be an organization okay. per se, right? Okay, okay. The strategy is that you know how to network, collaborate across sector and get out of your cubby hole and work laterally <laughs> and vertically <laughs> to make things happen, right? Uh -huh. So it teaches how to collaborate uh -huh. effectively and there's a, there's a a process of doing, it's, a, it's not a random activity. You have to do need assessment. You plan intervention on a problem. You evaluate the response and you re repeat that cycle of, you know, to get to where you want to go, you know. That's interesting. So in your experience, what do you think is one of the number one needs here in terms of the way we try to integrate um, persons that are disabled, what do you think is the number one challenge in well, this? Well, Mr. Coach, Mr. Miller just highlight that first is awareness, right? People are not aware that persons with disabilities have a life. They can do things, right? They can contribute to the wealth of their society. And they, can, they need to be given that respect and acknowledgement that, hey, this person is not just to be locked away because they have an impairment, mm -hmm. but they can be adapted, they can uh, accommodate, mm -hmm. you know? And so we have to see how we could rehabilitate this person and get back into the mainstream of society. Of and that's what CBI is all about, right? Mm -hmm. Take a person who have visual impairment or hearing impairment and make them functional. They could hold, hold a job, they could be educated, they can get a degree. And the people who are visually impaired, hearing impaired, have masters and PhDs because 
because they've adapted software and you know technology that can make them functional again. Okay. Mr. Mills using his wheelchair so he can get about. You know. Okay. So these are strategies that CBI and as a whole will promote. That yes, don't look at the problem, look at the solution, and there's a way to make it happen. Okay, awesome. So could you share examples of successful community-based initiatives in St. Kitts, Nevis? Well, we start with his association. It's been going since 1981 and it has created an avenue for person like Mr. Mills to, to become functional in society. Mm -hmm. Instead of being locked away in his home, he can come out on a daily basis to the center to do things that are productive and useful, get training and others can join along. And so having these centers of skill development and training, social support, is one of a CBI output activity that people are now congregating as a community of interest to rebuild a life, doing things, making crafts, doing, making condiments, things that they could sell to the US society. I noticed this was, um, this is the month of the the um, recognition of the disability, the disabled person. So mm -hmm. there was a match. So what are some of the other community activities that you guys are going to be doing for the month? Well, that just a month is all year round, right? Okay. Okay. I mean, the, the, well, the spine discussion is one activity. Okay. I think they have a social activity that they do. Mm -hmm. In August, we need this organize a two-week camp to showcase what can be done that people with disabilities are yearning to get out of their home, right? Mm -hmm. And so for those two weeks, people came out and they were asking when will it be, be repeated again, you know, mm -hmm. because they were so happy for the experience. Also, it was really supported. Yes. And I'm sure the family of the persons who are disabled were really happy that their relatives and their loved ones are able to get out there and get some fresh air and feel included. Oh, yes, my Mr. Mills and his team came over with a wheelchair accessible bus. Wow. And, and we went touring to the Botanical Garden, to the Food Orchard at Injun Castle. We went have a sports day at the ball field in Cotton Ground. So how did you access this wheelchair um, accessible bus? Is this a, in collaboration with the ministry? No, well the bus was donated to the association in 2016 by the, the then SIDF. It was, they donated the bus for us because we were looking at a way to be able to transport persons with disabilities to different functions and stuff like so that. That's, so then do we have a lot of those buses on island or just well, one or two? No, no, they do have um, some on the island that runs as taxis, but I think ours is the biggest one. Okay. Because we have a Toyota Coaster bus that can transport four wheelchairs at the, at the same time. Okay. And I don't think there's no other bu bus on the island that, that transport can do four at the, four same, at the same, time. same time. So uh, we was happy when SIDF came on board mm -hmm. to help us to get the bus. It's something we was looking for for a while. Mm -hmm. And then um, I was told to reach out because back then I was the president. Mm -hmm. And I was told to reach out to them and there was good about helping us to get it so um i would like if the how it goes citizen by investment mm -hmm. i would like if they would come on board to and help us to get some of the things and to further some of the programs that we are trying to do between our organization and and like Addis Place and um, Navy CBR, there's a lot of programs that we would like to be able to do. Of course. But funding is always a problem. Mm -hmm. So maybe if um, the powers that be listening, they could they are listening for sure. help, <laughs> help us with some of the CBI money <laughs> to promote some of these programs. You know, I always like to ask, I mean, if they come on board and give us and help us with some of this money. The mere fact that this is going this year tonight, yeah. you know, is an indication that they are listening. Yes, yeah, so we and could, and we could help more people with this. Do you guys do any fundraising? Yeah, we do fundraising. Mm. We pick it and we <coughs> write project proposals to get grant money. Okay. We have, um, currently, we have a, pro a project going on that, that is being funded by the Jeff Small Grants Program. Okay. That is a farming project. Okay. And then we have 
the NTRC National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission. Mm -hmm. They approved a project for us that would refurbish our computer lab, replace all the computers and stuff like that. And then so where's your center? So you have a whole computer lab and you have a whole resource center going on there? Well, we, we work out of the McNeil Community Center. The government was good enough to let us oh, use um, two rooms in the back and that we lock off. Okay, and you know. so I guess your coaster bus is at an undisclosed designated <laughs> no, location? We, we park it in, in the fire station at night. Okay, so yeah. it's really secure? Yeah. And so we should have it for a long time to come? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so we'll take another short break and when we come back, we are going to have some sound bites um, with persons discussing or bringing to light the the um, objectives of the disability programs. We'll be back shortly. and Company Limited, providing a greener future for the exceptional people that we value. Thank you again and welcome back to another episode of HealthWise. I'm your host, Dr. Lescott. I have with me the lovely Mrs. Mauricia, Mauricia Brown from the Ministry of Youth Empowerment, Aging and Disabilities. Good night again. It's lovely having you. Thank you. Okay, so what policies or programs has the government implemented to um, promote accessibility and inclusivity for persons with disabilities? Okay, um, well, since we launched in February, you know, um, it's now December. Mm -hmm. We are honestly still getting our feet wet. Mm -hmm. um, when we began, it was more about trying to um, introduce ourselves to the different institutions that work with persons with disabilities and start the discussions there. So in terms of policies or programs that we started since we've launched as a ministry or since a department, there's very little. Um, but there are the programs or things that, there are things that, in, that are in place that were in place before, okay. you know, on the social services. Mm -hmm. But now, of course, they're now moved on the, but some of them are under us. Um, since we launched, we have a radio show that we have on on Freedom FM on the Sister Sensei show the last Saturday every month. Mm -hmm. And so we either go on, I went on maybe once or twice, but other times we would have 
um, acts, either the association they went on Saturday or maybe um, at his place or any other person, any other body to go and talk about some sort of topic dealing with disability. We now have a radio jingle um, um, that's playing on air also on Freedom FM for now. Um, it's about five of them. It's basically an awareness campaign. One of them talks about terminologies, what you shouldn't say, or how you should approach persons with disabilities and such. Um, we had a number of consultations during the year and um, we even had a couple activities including Experience My Pain where several ministers including our junior minister Honorable Isolene Philip um, participated where they were blindfolded um, and they walked through the street of Bastia. Um, but other than that we have uh, um, subventions that are given monthly, one of them to the association to help cut costs, another one goes to Addie's Place. Of course, Mr. Mills mentioned the, the bus that was um, donated by SIDF. Mm -hmm. We have the Spectrum Center, Autism Center. Where is that? Up at the industrial, they share the space at the industrial daycare. The okay. Yeah. So, persons who are suspected to be on the spectrum, they can come for assessment and diagnosis yes. too? So yes. it's a full operational um, facility for it persons? Is. Okay. It is. I didn't, is there a fee attached? Is it a government run? It's government. So um, it, it's not like <coughs> you can go there or stay there. I understand. It's just for, like you said, assessment for the so most part. So you have to be referred. The person can't just come on their own is it that they had to the person would have had to be seen by a psychiatrist to be properly assessed and then referred or is it like a concerned parent that might notice their child isn't learning the same or mm -hmm. isn't so how how do I they I think I think it can be a combination of either one or either one it can be not necessarily a psychiatrist but it could be a concerned teacher mm -hmm. you know um, or it can be like you said a parent um, doctor Claxton Richardson, Claxton, Claxton Richardson. Um, she is the director for the center, mm -hmm. so she's the one who heads that whole, that whole unit. She's the best person to talk to. She knows, she knows her thing. Wow, I wish um, we had her here as a guest. <laughs> if Dr. Richardson, Claxton Richardson, mm -hmm. if you're out there listening, <laughs> I'm hoping next time I can have you so you can elaborate more yes, in your services. Yes, and yes. you sound like a superhero, so. Mm -hmm. I really would like to get to know mm -hmm. and just some of your superpowers. Yeah, that's true. And just recently, the same um, early childhood development in a partnership with, I think it's UNICEF, they launched the, the Autism Project. This is, it was launched in, I think, October, late October, early November. And so, of this year? Mm -hmm. Okay. So it was, it's basically to help stakeholders identify developmental delays or autism in younger children so that intervention can, can, can begin at an earlier stage. So, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I participated in one of them, or well, two of them, and we had, when I was there, I remember um, preschool you teachers. Assessed? You mean you, you said you participated? Meaning, meaning they invited different stakeholders to be aware of certain delays or signs you know so that when um if you see any of these as they call them red flags you know you can know how to go about in having the child be helped in the best way possible understood mm -hmm. so tell us more about these terminologies because i myself was very guilty of um i was very guilty earlier in the show mm -hmm. for not expressing the correct terminology it's not disabled persons it's persons with a disability and also not differently abled people persons but when i was in school that's what they told us it's a differently able so now i guess every year the change the, the terminology is changed and I'm, I'm trying my best to keep up i understand i understand the things change the terminologies is what people with disabilities say the terminologies are i understand because um, I'm yet to find somebody who can explain to me what differently abled means. 
Well, that's I, don't, true. I don't know what it means. <laughs> so, uh, people with disabilities don't you because we try to put the person first, mm -hmm. and that's why it's put people with disabilities because it's a person first approach. And I mean, I understand definitely. Yeah. I, I definitely mm -hmm. I stand corrected. So, if I offended anyone with mislabels please have my humblest apologies and um, it's a learning curve for me too mm -hmm. and I humbly accept the correction impairment look at the person first and, and give them a chance to prove what they can do you know mm -hmm. and I see how you could help them to maximize what they have remaining mm -hmm. and so the people first concept is what is driving the current thinking gotcha I, yes. I totally get yes. it I totally get it. So, um, so like for instance, with I think autism, I was corrected some time ago. Um, some persons don't like to be called, of course, artistic, or be, or say you know, um, artist, art, person, autism. The term now is neurodivergent. Wow, I have never even heard of. I must probably write that yeah. down so I can remember the the <laughs> next time I'm, I'm in. The, the presence, I would not offend anybody. You okay. It's neurodivergence. Divergent. Diversity, yeah. Neurodivergent. Di Diverg oh, yeah. Neurodivergent. You, you want to try and elaborate? <laughs> I am still learning. So that's the term. Neurodivergent. Uh -huh. Well, from a medical perspective, I mean, people develop at different stages and weights, you know. True. And so you don't want to lock a person into a, into a barrel to all <laughs> life. <laughs> so you have yeah. said that there are diversity in the new neurological development. So that concept of, you know, Interesting, because what I'm neurodiversity is, is with autism, it's <laughs> it is not like Down syndrome where, okay, you can, if you know what to look for, you can identify a person with um, Down syndrome. Autism has it's so many red spectrum. Yes, that's it's why it's very, it has it's so many spectrum. red flags. Mm -hmm. So, I'm if I am on the spectrum and you're on the spectrum, we have we are still totally different. So I guess that's where the divergent uh, comes in. That term. interesting. I'm still I'll I'll mm. I'll accept all new information with open arms. So we'll go to the next question. Mm -hmm. So how can government agencies collaborate more effectively with? NGOs and other stakeholders to create more inclusive inclusivity in the communities. What do you think? Um, I think one of the first things we have to do is to um, first see what other ministries are up to mm -hmm. and what they're about, what they bring. Mm -hmm. Just recently I learned of um, a program on the NHC. Um, NHC? So yeah. The well, housing? Yeah. It's social. Well, it's different. But um, social assistant living I think is that's what it's called oh. so I, I wasn't aware of that before and so one of the things we want to do or we hope to do next year is to find out from not just ministries but different units institutions to find out what are you about what programs do you have to offer and see how we could see how it can benefit the population that we serve of course and then that way when we meet with different groups now the the institutions that work with personal disabilities we can say hey this ministry this institution offers ABC and so we can try to sort of bridge the gap between because there might be benefits out there that a lot of persons just don't know about mm -hmm. you know and um, to of course continue to bring awareness to these ministries and these different institutions because disability is a term that I believe is a, is a scary word I guess it, it's a bit triggering yeah you don't want to talk about it um, just just recently we had we, um, they had the walk in my shoe activity on Friday and so I was invited to participate by using a wheelchair so myself and the Honorable Minister Isolin Philip that was the, the, the match that I saw there was on a Friday? match at Fort Street yes, yes and they reversed roles so I saw some mm -hmm. persons with disability um, wheelchair mm -hmm. and pushing persons that were not with a disability so they had a role reversal something type like of thing. that but okay. yeah but I, I i was in the wheelchair from the start right to the end 
and later that evening after it was all said and done I went into Rams and one of the workers he looked at me and said miss I didn't just see you out there in a wheelchair <laughs> he did not he understand thought, the assignment he thought he thought I had a disability I and gotcha. the way he ended the conversation as I made it sound like disability is a scary thing so which one we want to take that away from persons who work in ministries because that to me would help them want to Reach work out. further yes mm -hmm. um, with um, the populations that we serve and as well have NGOs more at the table Mr. Mills spoke about it I feel like slowly but surely um, persons are being or the institutions are being contacted to participate in certain meetings and such it's still slow uh, but we hope to you know um, encourage other ministries or institutions to bring them to the table um, next year I must mention though and something from the previous question you asked in recent times in recent recently I think back up in since May April May somewhere up there um, a sign language interpreter has now been or uh, is now present at Parliament mm. and national addresses so that's something new but to question how if I wanted to learn sign language how do I learn it and is it expensive <laughs> where do I go to learn such because I mm -hmm. participate with certain like when I was younger I was into the Red Cross and like mm -hmm. different things I learned a bit but I was I was much younger and I don't think I remember <laughs> <laughs> some of the things now uh -huh. but if I wanted to get like a refresher if I wanted to um, learn mm -hmm. sign where do I go in St. Kitts? Reach out to uh, the principal for Cotton Thomas Mr. Duo he would be a good person to reach out to because if we're looking uh, at policies and what's not why can't we make this part of mm -hmm. a, a school program we want to introduce all of these foreign language yeah, what about the true. universal language of sign yes, you can would exactly. be a good person to reach out to us. you can be English Latino French mm -hmm. and all of them would understand sign, sign but yeah. we're teaching the children mm -hmm. the languages but then we're leaving out Mm -hmm. one universal one that can take them but, anywhere but in the world. I say every activity, every program should have a sign language interpretation. I mean this program tonight should, should have, have had a sign, sign language, language interpretation. Yeah. That would have been a really <laughs> good addition. We, we actually ask somebody to be on but yeah. um, so we have a good amount of persons on the island yeah. who know sign? It was, yeah there's quite a, a good amount of persons but there was actually some scheduling conflicts. Okay. Us, so mm -hmm. So you said we Mr. actually was trying to get somebody on. So but this conversation will help to highlight it in the public consciousness. Mm. Of course, and you so said uh, Mr. Door Cotton Thomas. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to reach out to him. You know, <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. And this Jacobs is a good and person. Yeah. Yeah. Next year we hope to have a um, work in the, um, a workshop on sign language. That would be yeah. awesome. If there's a workshop, I hope you guys are able to publicize it highly so it can reach my eyes and I can sign up. So, mm. Sometimes there are online courses that. Like recently, the, the, the society in St. Vincent, the, the Voice of the Disabled, they organized with a facilitator from St. Lucia, I think, to put on a, a sign language course, mm. which was partially online as well and, and a kind of kinda blended, blended experience. I got you. I mean, that's a good idea. Um, I can probably, I guess, look online. I'm hoping it's not like a huge fee because I know these are specialty skills basically mm -hmm. you're gonna need a special uh, like a special specialty person to mm -hmm. to teach that yeah but some of these groups like they can't get funding to to compensate the facilitator so the participants may not really have to put their hand in pocket to but you know since i've been home i haven't seen many persons with the guide dogs like i see overseas we don't have those the canines it's not it's not something that um is done here much because most of the places that you would want to go Don't they have they have the signs on the door that you can bring your dog in there but, but overseas uh, if it's a service dog overseas there are legislations that prevent persons from so that would be see, one that's thing. why we need legislative change in, in the country <laughs> because if we don't get legis legislative change a lot of the stuff that we try we talk about because one of the th the most irritating things for me is when somebody would tell me something about this happened in a way. 
and this happened in this country but the same person who know that they used to live in this country and people with disabilities were treated different mm -hmm. these same persons would not get on board and say well go talk to the representative and tell the representative to bring it to to parliament and they wouldn't go talk to somebody who they know and they wouldn't come join the association and help us with the advocacy work okay so it irritates me because if you know that these things happen and these things is good things mm -hmm. why is you not helping us to get to bring about these changes and that is some of the questions i, I keep asking because it's only now since I've having, I'm having this discussion, I noticed that I don't see many guide dogs. Mm -hmm. So I guess since we were speaking along the lines of having legislations and laws, then I think a guide dog legislation would be a really good way to start because persons would be more protected, more guided. You have a, an extra set of eyes because I realize these dogs really look out for the owners. They really, mm -hmm. really do. And I think mm -hmm. it would be awesome if they're able to travel and traverse mm -hmm. to Bastia with their guide dogs you know sure. okay so we'll take one more sorry we'll take um, a, another commercial break and uh, I'll will be standing by Content. And you know what excites me? Precision. Just like crunching numbers accurately, National Bank's Apex Mortgage offers the lowest interest rate in the country, 3.99% guaranteed. Precision is essential in construction as well. Just buy Apex Mortgage's attention to the detail of our dreams. If you are a college or university graduate, this is your opportunity. Details are everything for an engineer, and Apex Mortgage recognizes this. Offering up to 40 years for repayment, it perfectly complements my whole ownership needs. Plus, National has my back with a three month payment grace period. Apex Mortgage for me and me. And me too. Get your dream home. National Home Loans. Home ownership made easy. When you're with National, you're home. It's that time of year, and Office Machines is giving that free to all customers who will be purchasing any Xerox photocopier, printer, and scan machine solutions during the months of November and December. This offer is supported by the most experienced, trained, and competent field service repair and maintenance staff in St. Kitts and Nevis. Come see us at our offices on Keon Street, past St. Kitts, telephone number 465-4046 or at the Solomon's Arcade in Charlestown, Nevis, telephone number 469-5883. This is no gimmick. Come or give us a call. We're ready to make you happy that you have invested in the best with a Xerox machine supported by caring and professional service. Terms and conditions apply. And welcome back. Thank you for tuning in on another episode of HealthWise. I'm your host, Dr. Monique Lescott. And um, we have a very skilled and uh, knowledgeable panel of persons here representing the um, Persons with Disabilities Association. Um, so we're going to continue our discussion. I'm going to throw this question out there and all of you guys can take turns answering it and giving your own personal perspective. So um, in what ways can collaboration between the business community, government entities, and uh, disability-focused organizations create an environment that promotes accessibility, inclusivity, and economic empowerment for persons with disabilities? What? could that collaboration look like like in your opinion and from your perspective what can those such things look like well as a community activist and a medical practitioner as well we want to see our patients being functional 
is no joy to see a person always suffering. And so we go start to that conversation. How can I help you? And you know, sometimes it's a very simple solution. Most of the cases, person just want ease of access, and the UN Convention speaks to reasonable accommodation so that a person with a disability, instead of being shut out of the workplace, can return to work if you just make a ramp or you reassign them to do certain specific tasks which they are good at. Instead of them doing everything in the workflow, this is your specialism. Because of your disability, you could just do that one task. Mm -hmm. And people do that well. People on the spectrum, they are good at certain things which they are masters at, right? Of course. And so we have to recognize that diversity and allow people to, to function to do what they can do it well. And to shine. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so, conversations that are harmonious, not, not just say, so, oh, you have a problem and you dismiss them, but let's see how we can make you functional. Awesome. And so that awareness is key. Awareness. And once you have that awareness, then you begin to see all possibilities. So quickly, I'll let you guys, both of you, and then we're going to go on to some sound bites from um, persons mm -hmm. that are, were not able to make it on the panel to oh give okay. their input as well. So you're the okay. same question. Well, um, it starts with a conversation. It's, and that's what we're trying to start here tonight, start a national conversation. It but before you go on, who is your representative in parliament? Um, Dr. The Honorable Jeffrey Hanley. Okay. That's my representative and my friend also. Awesome. So, uh, but it starts there. It starts because that collaboration has to give persons with disabilities a greater voice. Um, I know I keep saying it for the whole night, but if you don't give people with disabilities a greater voice, then we're going to continue to get marginalized because we can identify things that would work better for us. I can identify what would work better for a person in a wheelchair because I use a wheelchair 24-7. So I know that if I go to certain places and I could just, even without getting on the ramp, I could look at it and say, well, that ain't going to work. You know? It's already and discouraging for yeah. you. Mm -hmm. And then. Appendix F is there, but nobody pays attention to it. And if we can't get the government to take it and make it mandatory by listening to the people with the disabilities, because that collaboration has to start from the grassroots. It has to start from the bottom up, because we can't have the people at the top just dictating what happens. Because many of those people at the top they don't understand what it is to live with a disability and they need to listen to the people with the disabilities. I understand. So that's, that collaboration has to include the people with the disabilities in whatever decision that you're making. It has to be, I would suggest that in the federation that we create sort of a, um, a national disability coalition where it have government ministry trees, organizations of persons with disabilities, the private sector and civil society organizations where we can sit Like a 360 approach. Yeah. We can sit together and look at the whole thing, look at the development. We're developing up this area. How does it work? Does it have the provisions that would ensure that people with disabilities can participate in this sector that we are developing? Tourism is our main industry. How does you develop tourism in, in a, such a way that people with disabilities who, included in who come here as tourists and who live here is totally included. So that's, that's kind of how it has to work. We have to look at the different sectors and see how we can develop them up to ensure people with disabilities are fully integrated. Awesome. Not to cut the discussion short, but I really wanted to include the sound bites. So if we can just get to the sound bites so we can share more of a variety of the show, we'll have that now. For question one, uh, our group believed that it was extremely important that we commit to being knowledgeable of local, regional, and international disability legislation and policies yes. in order to boost our own knowledge so that we can effectively advocate. And at the next point, I will allow Bernard. Yeah, 
so the next point is for the adoption of the community-based rehabilitation, community-based inclusive development declaration of St. John's. And this is a very important document that seeks to um, unify the Caribbean on the, an inclusive development agenda for persons with disabilities through CBR. Yes, thank you. In terms of question two, developing action plan for Caribbean collaboration, uh, we understood the importance of utilizing technology and the virtual sustaining relationships and having continued that dialogue with our sister organizations in the region. On the third question of uh, the inputs of the Global Advocacy Network, what can we then do to assist the movement in the Caribbean, especially from the DBI NAC family? We at DBI NAC strongly recommend a formal partnership and the NAC for the United Advocacy and Mutual Learning and Development. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, others who have not yet reported, we will snatch that back. So, that wraps up this week's um, episode of HealthWise. I am your host, Dr. Monique Lescott, and uh, my very lovely panelists that joined us here. I would like to thank you guys from the bottom of my heart for coming and shedding so much light on uh, an area that I don't think I had much knowledge about, I'll be quite honest with you. So uh, I welcome the opportunity to learn and I really thank you guys for coming and being a part of um, our round table. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having us. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much out there to you guys in TV and internet YouTube land. <laughs> thank you.